the great lumbering beast makes the earth tremble as it moves across the African savanna. It bears huge ivory tusks as its only defense against predators. Its eyes, however, reveal a very human quality as it makes this long trek by memory. And if you didn't know any better, you might think this great beast was crying. It's been said that an elephant never forgets. How true that statement is as we listen for the heartbeat of the internet. I'm Don Jackson. Lawrence Anthony, author of three books, was known the world over as the Elephant Whisperer, mostly because of one of those best-selling books of the same name. But if truth be told, he was a legend in South Africa and around the world for his tireless work rescuing wildlife and rehabilitating elephants. One of his most courageous rescues involved the animals at the Baghdad Zoo during the 2003 invasion by the U.S. Anthony died at the age of 62 on March 7, 2012. Two days after his death, a miracle happened. Two large matriarchs showed up at his home, leading a group of wild elephants. There were actually separate herds that had come trudging through the bush. In all, 31 elephants had patiently walked over 12 miles in single file to Anthony's South African home. In what can only be described as a show of respect for his passing, the people who witnessed this event were awestruck. Anthony's son Dylan said these particular elephants were saved by his father and hadn't returned to the author's home for about a year and a half. They remained just outside the house for two days, not consuming anything during their stay. When the sun rose in the early morning after the two days and nights had passed, they left and made the journey back to where they had come from. What was it that compelled these wild elephants to make the trek from separate points? Was there some kind of mental connection between these elephants and the man who had once saved their lives? When that link was broken, did they realize that their human friend had passed on? We'll never know for sure, but I'm convinced that what they say about an elephant never forgetting was witnessed in a most sensitive display. What the South African elephants displayed in that remarkable story can't help but make you wonder about something that goes even deeper than the so-called superior intelligence of humans. Something almost on a scale of a mastermind that connects every living thing, plants and animals, humans and the earth we call our own. But there are some memories we would do anything to forget. Pat Morrison, sometime back in the Los Angeles Times, wrote, What a maddening thing a memory can be, dodging away from you when you're trying desperately to snag it, descending around you like a collapsing tent when you want to forget it. There is an ancient Greek legend about the river of Leith. After people died and went to heaven in this myth, there might come a time when they would choose to be born again. But before this could happen, they needed to forget their memories of the lives they once lived. The water from the river of Leith provided them with forgetfulness so that they could begin a new life with a clean slate. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind from 2004 starred Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. When their relationship goes bad, Winslet's character turns to a company that can erase all memories of their relationship. It's a fairly lengthy, complex procedure, and after hearing she's done this, Carrie's character decides to do the same thing. But during the procedure, he decides in his mind, while he's having his memories erased, that he doesn't want to forget, and tries to hide his memories away from the probing eyes of the computer program that's seeking them out and destroying them. 
filled with special effects, it gives us pause to make sure we're certain that we want what technology has to offer, because once they're in, it's almost impossible to get them out. You might remember the program where I talked about an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. It featured the android Data erasing the subroutine he had written about love. He wrote this program so that he could return affection to a female crew member who was showing feelings toward him. In that recent webcast, I wondered aloud about the ease of erasing the pain of heartbreak as demonstrated by the simple clearing of a robot's memory banks. Given the opportunity to erase painful memories related to a broken heart, I now wonder how many might also be willing to line up to drink from the waters of Leith. Scientists are close to producing a memory storage device the size of a sugar cube that you could wear around your neck. In a sense, you might think of it as a personal black box recorder containing maybe home movies from the past, your report cards from school, bank records, and the like. You could theoretically store all your memories on a device no bigger than a sugar cube. We're pretty close to something like that with our flash drives. But how would you like a device like that implanted in your brain at birth? Everything you see would be recorded and able to be played back after your life is over. At funerals, you see a photographic collage of the life of the deceased in the foyer of the memorial chapel. These photos are usually displayed on easels and able to be seen as you walk through the outer doors and into the chapel for the memorial. What about watching a DVD of what that person actually saw and experienced? 2004 seems to have been a good year for movies concerning memories. There was a dark Robin Williams film about a time in the future when humans at birth would have a memory chip implanted in the brain that records through a person's eyes every single image ever witnessed over the course of a lifetime. The black box of a person's life in other words. The film was called The Final Cut. When a person dies, an editor goes through every single image and compiles a memorial for the funeral of that person's life. Hours upon hours are spent downloading and editing the lifetime of images. The task seems daunting, but it must be undertaken by a compassionate professional, one who knows how to condense a life in a short film. Robin Williams' character is one of them. Now, there are quite a few philosophical issues that the film tackles. The editor decides what is important enough to be included in the memorial, what should be kept, what should be left on the cutting room floor. This editor is also entrusted to look at events that may never have been revealed by the person who experienced them, memories that he or she may have wanted buried along with them and such is the case in the film, where something very dark appears before the editor's eyes. He uses all his skills to try to find out exactly what happened, because there was never any police record or mention of this incident during that person's lifetime. This sugar cube-like device that I spoke of earlier, that apparently is in the development stages, gives me the impression that this memory implant might not be that far away. And we can't help but wonder if the film is a harbinger of things to come. You'd be surprised how little it takes to make a fuzzy memory crystal clear. Music is probably the most successful way to relive distant memories. But sometimes, it's not that easy. Sometimes the memories elude us. The direction that the technology I've been discussing could take at some far distant point in the future might be as a backup for those who suffer a catastrophic memory loss due to disease or an accident. Consider Alzheimer's patients 
or Jason Bourne's accidental memory loss in Robert Ludlum's Bourne identity. The lost memories could be re-implanted. Now that's the upside to all this, but there is always the darker side to consider and what an unscrupulous individual could do with that kind of technology at hand. But for the time being, let's just remember. One of my favorite chicken soup stories was called When Winter Was Warm by Storm Stafford and published in 1998 in Chicken Soup for the Veteran Soul. And I quote, Do you think I'm crazy? Miss Lawrence would ask every time I visited her. Everyone is a little crazy in their own way, I would always answer. I didn't belong in Miss Lawrence's house, but I couldn't help tagging along with my older brother when he did chores for the old woman. Miss Lawrence paid my brother $5 a week to chop wood for her little stove and to bring groceries when she needed something. I washed her few dishes and sometimes did her laundry. Our mother would often send extra food with us, trying to put a few pounds on the tiny old woman's bones. Be sure you set out a plate for John. He might come home today, Miss Lawrence would say when I put the food on the table. She'd been setting an extra plate on the table for 72 years waiting for John to return from World War I. John had hair the color of oak leaves in October. No one else ever had such beautiful hair. My own mother used to say it was a shame that such beautiful hair was wasted on a boy. Miss Lawrence would smile and her wrinkles would deepen. We were both 17 when he left for the war. He promised we'd be sweethearts forever and he promised he'd come home. Those were the times I could almost see that 17-year-old girl. Miss Lawrence would smooth back her dry white hair and tuck the wispy ends into the messy bun on top of her head. She'd been blonde when she was young and had worn her hair in curls. Sometimes when she'd laugh about something, her eyes would sparkle again just for an instant. That must have been how she looked when she was with John. I thought they must have been such a handsome young couple. Everyone knew John had died somewhere in Germany during the bitter winter, but she would never believe it. Finally, people just found it easier and kinder to let her believe he was coming home. End quote. The conclusion is next. The story is called When Winter Was Warm by Storm Stafford, published in 1998 in Chicken Soup for the Veteran's Soul. As a young girl, she went with her brother to the house of an elderly woman called Miss Lawrence. He would do chores for her while the author listened to stories of her great love affair with John. He went away to war, but never returned. Miss Lawrence always believed he was coming home, but folks knew better. Again, I quote, Ms. Lawrence never married, never had children. Over the years, her parents and sisters and friends had died, and now she was alone. Her only visitors were my brother and I, and a nurse the county sent to her house once a month to check on her health. Even in the summer, my brother still had to build a small fire in the pot stove before we left every afternoon. It's funny, Ms. Lawrence said. The weather used to be so different. When I was a girl, the winters were warm. John and I used to walk in the forest and I'd slip my hand into his mitten. Sometimes he'd reach up and shake a branch and the snowflakes would fall down on us, but we never felt cold. I was never cold when I was with John. After John left, the weather changed and I was never warm again. As I listened to Miss Lawrence, World War I wasn't just something in a history book anymore. For my brother and me, it was something horrible that slaughtered thousands of young boys like John. Pain and loss and loneliness Miss Lawrence felt were just as fresh as if the war had happened yesterday. I felt sorry for all the soldiers who were killed. I felt sorry for the soldiers who came home with wounded bodies and wounded hearts. But mostly I felt sorry for Miss Lawrence and all the young women like her who waited for their sweethearts to come home. No one talks about the girls who were left behind, 
They don't have a holiday and they didn't get any medals, but they were so very brave and they were so terribly wounded. One of the last times I visited Miss Lawrence, she told me all her stories again, but this time she asked a favor. Will you make me a promise? She laid her thin hand on my shoulder. Will you promise me that you will never forget John? Someone has to remember John. Her voice trembled. I remember John had hair the color of oak leaves in October, I said, and you were both 17, and you walked in the woods and he shook the tree branches and snow fell on you, and you were sweethearts forever. Yes, yes. Sighing, she smiled sadly. You do remember. Now someone else will always remember. An incredible story. When Winter Was Warm by Storm Stafford. I finish with an unforgettable tribute from daughter to her father's memory, immortalizing their voices together in song. I'm Don Jackson. <laughs>